Well, as it is the first Sunday of the new year, I'd like to wish you all a very happy new year, or the Lord's very best for you for 2024. And thank you. And rather than continue on through our through the Bible study for today, uh, we're actually in the book of Acts as we're going through the Bible. That's on, we're going to pick that up next time, continue our through. If, it, if you're new to us, what we usually do is we go through the scriptures verse by verse and we'll start again on that next week, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, going through the Bible and in the book of Acts. But for today... Seeing it is the first Sunday of the new year, I'd like us to consider the subject of stewardship for 2024. Let me read you something that I like to read at the beginning of the new year, something someone wrote about <clears throat> the new year. In your hands has been placed a priceless gift. Look at it closely. There's no price marker stamped on it. It cannot be weighed because no scale can balance its value. A king's ransom in comparison is as nothing yet it is given to beggar and prince alike. The giver asks only that it be used wisely and well. This jewel, rare and unique, is not displayed in any shop window. It cannot be purchased, it cannot be sold, no other treasure holds the possibility this gift offers. None can surpass its golden splendor. Of all gifts, this is the one, the most precious. It's been offered many times before. Today, from the depths of a limitless love, it is given again. It will be left to you to find the golden thread running through it, only with great care. Will the jewel retain its luster, carelessness, ingratitude, and Selfishness will tarnish the brilliance, break the unspoiled thread, mar the perfection. Guard it closely, lest through weak fingers it slip from the hand. Look often at its faultless beauty. Accept it as it is offered from the heart of the giver. Consider it, it is the most treasured of possessions. For of all gifts it is by far the greatest is the gift of the new year. And we might add to that that <clears throat> God has graciously granted us another new year. Here we are. First Sunday of a new year. And for many of us, of course, when you think about the new year, it's like it gives you a new start. You know, this is an opportunity for a new start. And it, <laughs> yeah, it's a time to make New Year's resolutions. I don't know if you made any. Did you make any? No. Did you break them yet? <laughs> For many of us, it's sort of about our diet. You know, usually after overindulging at Christmas, we, we like to slim down a bit. The last few years, it's sort of gone like this for me. 2020, I'll get my weight down below 180 pounds. 2021, I will follow my new diet religiously until I get below 200 pounds. <laughs> 2022, I will develop a realistic attitude about my weight. 2023, I'll join a gym and work out. 2024, I will try to drive past the gym at least once a week. <laughs> Yeah, I watched one of those exercise videos once. Didn't do me any good at all. <laughs> well, before we hurtle into 2024, I, I think it's appropriate to take stock of the past year and sort of consider what kind of steward we've been. So I'm going to read just a couple of verses from chapter 16 of Luke. I'm not going to do the whole parable. It's the whole parable of the unjust steward. I'm not going to do that. Just a couple of verses so we can get the, the sort of text for today. Luke 16, verse 1. And he also said to his disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. 
So he called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. So this man's been wasting his master's goods. He's about to get fired. As I say, I'm not going to go through further with the parable today. just wanted to focus on the subject of stewardship. And I think this is an appropriate text, a couple of verses here, regarding what, uh, what we've done with what God's given us. Webster's Dictionary says stewardship is the management of an estate or organization. The Greek word for stewardship is the same word that we get our word economics from. It's that which God has committed to you and to me for his care. It's that he's committed it to you and me for us to care for his stuff. He's required all of us to give an account for that which he's blessed us with. And may I say, everyone on this planet is accountable to God for what he's given. Everyone. Even those <clears throat> who do not follow the Lord, you know, maybe, maybe they, they don't believe in God or whatever, they think, well, uh, this got nothing to do, I got nothing to do with God, so this is not really applied to me, but all humans are God's subjects. Even if they don't belong to his family, if they haven't made a commitment, if they don't believe in God, one day they will be held accountable. Of course, first of all, for their sin, for rejecting Jesus Christ, but also for squandering what God has given. Now, believers, of course, we're on a different footing, especially in regards to our sin, we, we've been cleansed of our sin. Isn't that wonderful that, that we can go into this new year knowing that we are saved by grace, a member of his family, and standing in the righteousness of Christ. But I'm sure that we are all aware that we've been entrusted with talents and resources all to be used for God's glory. But now, especially as one who have We've given our lives to Christ, so therefore we've become a servant of the Lord. And as his servant, we are accountable as a, a manager, as it were, of God's estate. And so what kind of job did we do in this past year? What kind of steward have I been? Pastor, elder, greeter, Sunday school teacher, singers, Christian workers, mothers, fathers, Husbands, wives, and whatever field you may be involved in. What kind of steward have you been? You see, we're only allotted so much time. I wonder if you've got used to writing 2024 yet. You know, when you have to give the date or something. I don't know, writing a check or something. Time goes by so quickly, doesn't it? 2024? And so little time to accomplish that which God has called you to accomplish. There will be a time when give an account of your stewardship for you can no longer be stewards will apply and be true to all of us. For there will come a time when it will all be over. That is no longer will you be a steward in regard to being on this planet or being in this age at this time. So let's consider a few areas where we should be a good steward. What about our time? The months, the weeks, the days, the hours that have made up this last year. How many hours have been frittered away? Now, for those that are not converted, those are not believers, they are not excused regarding the giving of their time. You count up the hours, surely the wasted hours, surely will we'll condemn them as you realize that what precious little time or no time at all that's been given to the pursuit of God. All the hours spent in the bar or in the nightclub, or on the golf course or on the beach or given over to sin and self and Satan. Well, God holds all people accountable, even if they are unbelievers. 
He holds them accountable for the time that they spend here on earth. Although they may not acknowledge it, be assured that God has lent every moment that they exist to them. You might say, they're living on borrowed time. Now, believer, there is no condemnation awaiting you. No judgment awaits you. Lest we be found an unjust steward, though, we ought to ask ourselves to give an account of the stewardship of our time. So that one day he might say to all of us, well done, now good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of the Lord. What have you done with your months, your weeks, your hours? Well, I certainly hope that you haven't spent them in ungodly pursuits. Those things are not for you. But how many hours of gossip have we logged up? What about all that digital gossip? How many, how much time some, you know, okay, we all need to make a living, but some people seem to spend all their time at work, even to the detriment of their families. How much time in the theater? <clears throat> this is convicting. How much time in front of the tube? There's only so much time allotted to our life, so we are stewards of time. Once it's gone, it's gone. Just a little minute. A tiny little minute. Only 60 seconds in it. Forced upon me. Can't refuse it. Didn't seek it. Didn't choose it. Must suffer if I lose it. Give an account if I abuse it. Just a tiny little minute, but eternity is in it. Sounds like rap, doesn't it? <laughs> it's a rap song. Once it's gone, it's gone. He can't go back and change it. time we're accountable to give an account of it so now as well as our time we're also accountable for what we do with our talents and abilities we all vary in talent and ability some may have a lovely voice others play well on a musical instrument or write lovely words or some are useful with their hands some have great physical strength that they can use and maybe they fix your car, folks fixing cars or sewing clothes. <clears throat> Some are good with the artwork. Some are good with children. All have been endowed to a certain degree with a certain ability or talent. Now, there are some in this world that have been given an abundance of talent. And yet, they waste it all. What an accounting they will have to give. <clears throat> Voltaire, George Bernard Shaw, Bertram Russell, Ernest Hemingway, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, gifted men, tremendously gifted men, but atheist all. What a reckoning <clears throat> they will come to having laid their intellect at Satan's feet. <laughs> Funny. I read recently that the top U.S. artist, music artist, strangely enough, is still Michael Jackson. Followed, of course, by the hugely popular Taylor Swift. And you have Beyonce, Miley Cyrus, and you go on and on. And these people are adored by millions. Gifted people, no doubt. Gifted. And people will say, they're so gifted. Well, if you're gifted, who gave you the gift? You all had Christmas gifts, I would imagine. <clears throat> By the way, thank you, me and Carol, thank you all for the, the gifts that several of you gave to me and Carol. I appreciate it. But you, you, if you have a gift, <clears throat> it's been given to you by somebody. Well, who gave them the gift? Say, gifted people... Who gave them the gift? Well, they're accountable to him who gave them that gift. And they figure an answer for it one day. They have writers, movie makers. You have your Stephen King, George Lucas, Stephen Spielberg, Spielberg James Cameron, <coughs> Christopher Nolan. <coughs> Tremendously talented people. And then you have those endowed with 
<clears throat> skills that allow them to excel in sports. LeBron James, Lionel Messi. Will somebody please tell me why he left Barcelona to play for Miami? <laughs> Best soccer player in the world? I don't know. Money? I don't know. Djokovic, Carlos Alcaraz. And you have many of the NFL players, wonderfully talented people. But do any of them use their talent for the glory of God? Well, some of them do, but it seems that most are really just concerned with what man might glory in them, the glory they may get for themselves. To whom much is given, much is required. All will have to give an account. But humble believer, we must not leave ourselves out. Well, we might think, well, you've mentioned some very famous people there, Malcolm. I don't think I have much talent. Surely there can't be much required of me. I don't have a lot. Well, look at the talent that you have and the gift that God's given to you and ask yourself, what did you do with it? Whether it be great or small, that's not the point. We're all required to give an account of that which God has given to us. You remember the parable of the talents. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants, delivered his goods to them, and to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his own ability, and immediately he went on a journey. So that which was given is, is, is not so much given to them as a blessing, as he, you sort of read through the parable. Not, not that it's given, well, he gave gifts because it's such a blessing that God has given me this gift. That's not, not why he gave it to them. But rather, he gave it to them that they might use or invest it for the master. That's what the parable teaches, that he might give it that the, the recipient might give it back to the master with interest. And so each given differing amounts, but each one required to give an account. So you have a time, your talent. But now, you can't talk about stewardship without considering our resources or our wealth. Now I don't imagine that there are many here who are Multimillionaires. Most of us fall into the category of having just enough or just a little more than what it takes to make ends meet. But whether you have little or whether you have a lot, we're all required to give an account of it. I think about those ungodly billionaires, and there's a lot of them. There's a number of ungodly billionaires, isn't there, in the world. How embarrassing one day for them to have to give an account to the Lord. Now, some of them, they're billionaires and they still try to cheat on the taxes. <laughs> How embarrassing to get caught by Uncle Sam cheating on your taxes if you're a billionaire. <laughs> they're so much spent on themselves, on the yachts and the gambling and their cars and their... Not a penny given to the work of the Lord. Oh, you read about them, philanthropy, is it? They, give it, they, they like to, you know, make it known that they have given to some, something or other, but not really to the work of the Lord. And there are those that earn in a week <clears throat> what we could probably live on in a lifetime. My football team, they were playing this morning, they've finished playing now don't if you know the score I don't suppose any of you do but if you do I don't want to know because they've got it recorded so, I mean. but my football team soccer team they need a new goalie <clears throat> hey goalie we've got keep giving the ball away and the other team comes and scores so we need a new goalie <clears throat> it's reportedly that we want to sign one for he's on 180,000 pounds a week a week. That's nothing compared to some. Manchester City, well, the top, one of the top teams, they were champions last year. Uh, Manchester City player Kevin, Kevin De Bruyne 
makes 425,000 a week. Well, I'm thinking, I read that and I'm thinking, is there any money left to pay the rest of the team? Well, there's another fellow on the team, Erland Harland, Hurling Holland. He's on a weekly wage of 402,250. Uh, 402,250. Uh, 400, He's on a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. But that's, on, that's, that's only the half of it. You see, he gets more money every time he scores a goal. Bonus. He scores a lot of goals, does that guy. He's a great player. He scores a lot of goals. Scored, I think, 50 last year. And, and so it's reported, I read where it reported that with goal bonuses and the team win bonuses, they won a lot last year, he makes close, he made last year close to 900,000 pounds a week. That's beyond my comprehension. I can't even comprehend that. But God knows. He knows about every penny. And all will be held in account. But what about you and me? We, we, we might not have much. But have we been faithful in what we do have? With, with what we do have? You see, the amount doesn't matter to the Lord. It's really the heart. Whether pauper or millionaire. I mean, he looked up and he saw the rich putting their gifts into the treasury. And he saw also a certain poor widow putting in two mites. So he said, truly, I say to you that this poor widow has put more in than all. For all these out of their abundance have put in offerings for God. But she out of her poverty put in all the livelihood she had. Gave it all. Not much. But Jesus said it, it amounted in God's eyes to more. Sacrificial giving. And your home, humble as it may be, is it available to God? Your bank statement, as you look through it, is there an accounting that you can look at as giving to the work of the Lord? Now, in many ways, I'm sort of preaching to the choir here, or the converted, as they say, because we are so blessed. We're so blessed here at Calvary Chapel. There's so many people here that are so faithful in giving. You know, during COVID, sort of, we wondered, well, you know, the, the, nobody came to church. And, and some people, I, I still think they haven't really come back from that. They like to stay at home and watch online, which is, is okay, but we need to be together. Well, the numbers in attendance went down, but the offering went up. And this wasn't just us. I asked other pastors, how you, you know, how's the church? Oh, we're, nobody's coming right now, but our offering's gone up. This happened in, in when I, several pastors I spoke to. Amazing, marvelous. So we're blessed. But I, I do think that some still have to learn the blessing of giving. I think there are young teenagers. And it, same goes for you, just because, it, it, you know, well, your parents may give, may or may not. But that doesn't count for you if you're earning. Maybe you mow the grass or work at Chick-fil-A. You don't have much. You still learn to give. Because you form habits. You're forming good habits. And it doesn't matter whether you earn $20 a week or $2,000 a week. You have to give an account of it. Did you give anything to the work of the Lord? But I imagine there are young people who have not yet learned to give at all to the work of the Lord. Maybe you will this year, I hope so. Maybe even some of the older ones, you know. Because you see, if you don't start the habit of giving when we're young... We might not do so when we're older. And, and uh, you know, we rationalize. Well, I don't have much now. Just remember my needs. I don't, I don't make much now. I don't have much. Well, a strange phenomenon is, the more you get, the more you seem to need. 
You know, you get more, but you seem to, I don't know, is it because your toys get bigger? I don't know what happens there with some folks. More expensive. You see, you can form a stingy spirit no matter how much or how little we have. And we have to realize that all we have anyway, it's really the Lord's. He has given it to us. We're merely a steward. Now, many of you know me. You've been here, some of you, as long as me. Long time. Uh, there's a couple of folks been here longer than me. But 40 years we've been here now. And you, some of you, you know, those of you have been here a number of years, you know me. And, and uh, those of you that are new, you take my word for it. <laughs> you just have to, or you talk to them. I don't labor this subject and hardly ever speak of it, only when we come to it in the scriptures. I don't talk about money or beg for money or, or, or go on and on about this. And I, I hardly ever ask this question, but I'm going to ask it today. What have you done with your money in 2023? What will you do with it now or in 2024? Whether it be gold, silver or copper, we're all held accountable. Well, not only held accountable for time, talent and resource, but something we don't often consider in the context of this subject, and that is our influence. Our influence. You see, all of us are involved in the affecting of other people's lives. From our children to people that we work with, all have that sphere of influence for which we are held accountable. And parents, bless you. You fight that battle, don't you, to counteract the harmful influences of this world. And bless you for that. Because when we dedicate babies, we... We always pray that God will bring into their lives godly influences. Because thousands have suffered through the evil influences of our culture. What we used to call it, what is he? Drug, sex and rock and roll. Well, that harmed a lot of people. Then there's the occult and all kinds of evil influences in the world. And what an account the school teachers will have to give those who seek to undermine the faith of young people and, and especially those, the, the, those wicked professors. You, you know, your child goes off to college and there the crazy people claim many things that cannot be proven and somehow they turn them into facts that cannot be challenged. Wicked. And then you have the Planned Parenthood and abortionists, the pro-choice people and the newspaper reporters, the TV personalities, the kings and queens and presidents all must give an account of what they have done with their influence. To whom much is given, much is required. There are people on you know, the YouTube thing today that have the influence, they're called influencers, that's what they call them now. Over millions of people. How about you, Dad? Careful, your overindulgence in alcohol. Is that not a message to your child saying that drunkenness is not such a bad thing? How about you, Mom? If you don't dress modestly, is that not an advertisement to your daughter that modesty is not for 2024? You cannot, we cannot pass off the obligation that we have Unto our children, unto others. They're your kids, your responsibility. You have to give an account regarding our offspring. We have to. We must give an account of the influence that you had in their lives, and we all have influence. From the senator to the everyday worker, all. It's all the same to the Lord. On a positive note, as you refuse to partake of the filth in your office. You're an influencing that office away from sin toward righteousness as we are the salt of the earth. How will you influence 2024? So time, talent, 
resource, influence. And so may I suggest that before we go much further into another year of grace, we might stop and give an account lest we hurtle into the new year the same way we came out of the old one. And if we failed in our stewardship, we're not to let it condemn us or try to just forget it. No, that's not good. Face it and learn from it. And if we feel the disappointment of of being not such a good steward, then may that disappointment, when we realize, well, God is a God of forgiveness and and, and he still loves us. And, and may that cause our love for the Savior to grow even greater. And may that conviction draw us closer to the law and prize our Savior dearly. But may I suggest that we take heed to the words, give an account of your stewardship. You can no longer be steward. For let me ask you, how many more Januaries do you have left? Let me encourage you to work for God while you can. Serve the Lord while you can, while you're able. You don't ever want to face the bitter regret of being unable to serve the Lord because now you've been laid aside with sickness and weakened. Not able to do the things that you wanted to do. I was thinking about this this morning so when you have the ability, perhaps you don't have the desire. And when the older you have it, you, you know, you have the desire, but you don't have the ability. Nor the sad regret. Ask any who are battling disease, those who love the Lord. Ask them what's important in life. And they'll tell you there's precious little time to serve the Lord. You do everything you can do because there's so little time. And I speak especially to you young people. Use your strength. When it's gone, it's gone. And all that's left is regret. There's a picture in Greek mythology of time. It has the image of time being like an old man with long hair in front. And he's bald at the back. And the picture is of one who is you must catch while he's coming toward you because once he's passed, there's nothing left to grab. That's a new year. And all the bitter regret of the wealthy man who loses it all. Perhaps he gambled it away. Yes. And that's often when they sunk to the lowest and got nothing left, that's when they get saved. (laughs) And then they say, what I could have done with what I had. Well, you may not always be a a steward of the wealth that you have now. While you've got it, use it for the glory of God. Give. And in so doing, you store up treasures in heaven. As Jesus said, let us work while it is still day, for the night comes when no man can work. Moms and dads, children grow up. I I watched some of our staff, the young guys that have the little ones. Uh, precious little babies and they're growing and of course I, I look at them and I, 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 I think you know and sometimes I tell them enjoy it while you have them young while they like that enjoy those little babies because they won't be like that long and it goes by like that there comes a time when you're no longer steward over their lives use your stewardship wisely you cannot put off till tomorrow because you cannot do that forever. You, in regards to this earth, you're not immortal. You cannot put off till tomorrow forever. You run out of tomorrows. One day your stewardship will cease. One day, as my friend Alwyn, he's got a wonderful song. He's called Time. A great song, a wonderful song. He has a line in it. Time will slip into eternity. Recently, a friend of mine, a friend of ours, Carol and I, told us to watch Cliff Richard singing the Lord's Prayer to the tune of Old Lang Syne. It was, it was recorded back at the, in London at the celebration of the new millennium. That's like almost 25 years ago, folks. Seems like yesterday, doesn't it? Oh, I watched it. It's wonderful. 
Very, very moving. It's wonderful. And I thought as I watched it, good old Cliff. Because at one time, he was the biggest pop star in the UK for decades. But he was not ashamed to confess Christ and use his God-given talent for the glory of God. Well, it reminded me of another millennial celebration. Yeah, (laughs) almost 25 years ago. But it paints a good picture. You remember, it took place in Sydney, Australia. There's a man called Arthur Stace. He's converted after the war and he's there in, in Sydney. And although he could barely read or write, the Lord enabled him to write in an indelicate copper script the word eternity. And for 50 years, he would write it in chalk on sidewalks, railway steps, everywhere where there was people. And he became known as Mr. Eternity. And for all of those years, he confronted the people of the city with this one word gospel message, eternity. Anyway, they erected a fountain in honor of him right in the city center. But then at 12 o'clock midnight, as the world moved into the new millennium, there was the biggest firework uh, display Sydney Sydney had ever seen to celebrate the new millennium. And the climax of the fireworks show was the word eternity, written in huge letters on top of the Sydney Harbour Bridge. Blessing for the man. The ministry of this humble man continued then. The city was challenged again to think of eternity. You're running out of time. I wonder if you can stare eternity in the face and say with Paul, without fear, this is the reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed for that I know in whom I believed and I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that what I've committed to him until that day. I fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I've kept the faith. Finally, there's laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who've loved his appearing. I always like to read this Charles Spurgeon quote at the beginning of a new year. Many of you know it, but I always read it at the beginning of a new year. Rest in Christ more comfortably. Love God more earnestly. Serve your generation more intensely. Live while you live. Play not at living, but live in real earnest and let it never be said of you that you trod so lightly on the sands of time that you left no impress there. Make your mark upon your age and fill your appointed place. And as God shall help you, that when you are gathered to your fathers, you may not be forgotten, but the church may remember you because in her midst there are children born to God through your means. Spurgeon. You remember Moses at the Red Sea? The people are complaining. They're always complaining, weren't they? Poor Moses. And they're there at the Red Sea. The army's behind them and, and, and it, it's a horrible situation for them. And, and Moses gets real bold and says, Stand and see the salvation of the Lord. Then he runs and cries to God. Oh, God. What are we going to do? And the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward. This is not a time to hold back Moses. My, my will, my program is not going to be put on hold because of the circumstances here. No Egyptian army is going to prevent God's plan. Neither could the Red Sea. And see, God wants all of us to go forward. The Lord does not want an individual or a church to settle for spiritual mediocrity through unbelief or defeat or facing difficult circumstances. And sadly, the people of God throughout history have sort of always had that tendency to settle, to get comfortable, right from Moses to this day. No longer going forward. We're at home, we're sort of comfortable, and we've halted in our spiritual pursuits. Lost a vision, perhaps, of winning the loss to Christ. Not time to retreat. Time to put on sail or step on the gas. He said, tell them to go forward. In the days of Nehemiah, he sent back to Jerusalem to build a, 
the wall was it 50 something days they had to build it in ended up building it in why did he get it done why did the job get done because it says the people had a mind to work we have to guard against complacency like being happy in our, our, our little group here kind of like Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration let's build three tents and kind of hang out with Moses and Elijah that'd be fun well, there's a, a world down the mountain in need. We ought not to settle and just be comfortable with our little church group here. God might want to shake us up. You know, I was really blessed watching the Jesus Revolution movie last year. I watched it a few times. One of the most moving scenes for me is when the hippies are just beginning to fill the church there and some of the congregation are not happy. Tried to put pressure on Pastor Chuck not to allow them into church. Dirty people, whatever. Don't allow them in. Well, he told the people, Chuck told the people that they could make this their home. They were all welcome to stay. And then he said, or to leave. And some of them, the old timers, they, they'd been there before all this started to happen, got up and left. And then one older fella, got up and it looks like he's about to leave and he crosses the aisle and sits with the hippies I thought that was the best best part of the movie I thought that was the best scene in the movie very moving what an impact it had I mean what would we say to the Lord if he asked us why did you make more of an impact all the talent all the resources all that I blessed you with well, I took care of my little corner of your vineyard. But I said, go into all the world. God has blessed us. The fellowship, I think we've been blessed. We've had some victories. God's done some wonderful things here. But I think he has so much more. The battle isn't over yet. Now is the time for ourselves to be full. Our youth group is growing, but it's time for it to explode. We had a lovely men's prayer meeting yesterday. It was lovely. Good crowd. But what if our prayer meeting more than doubled? And our Bible studies too. And our outreaches and our offerings. And most of all, it's time to look further than these four walls. Do you not say, uh, do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields for they're already white for harvest. And I ask you, will you join me in believing God for an outpouring of his Holy Spirit upon us? You see, people come to know Jesus, not looking back, but looking forward. Doubt sees the obstacles. Faith sees the way. Doubt sees the darkest night. Faith sees the day. Doubt dreads to take a step. Faith soars on high. Doubt questions who believes. Faith answers I. I close with this little story. When Hudson Taylor, a famous missionary to, to China, when he first went to China, it was in a, a sailing vessel, in a ship. And... The ship ended up being pretty close to the shore of an island where there were cannibals. And it was becalmed. And it slowly drifting shoreward, unable to go about. And, well, the savages, cannibals, I don't know, got a knife and fork, waiting there on the seashore, <laughs> anticipating a feast. Well, the captain came to Mr. Taylor, besought him to pray for the help of God. Taylor said, I will, providing you set sail to catch the breeze. Well, the captain declined. He said, I don't want to make, I'll make myself look a fool, a laughingstock. If I unfurl the, the sails in this dead calm, there's no wind. Taylor said, well, I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to undertake, undertake to pray for the vessel unless you will prepare the sails. So he did. While engaged in prayer, there was a knock at the door of his stateroom and Taylor says, who's there? And the captain responded, are you still praying for wind? He says, yes. 
Well, said the captain, you better stop praying for we have more wind than we can manage. <laughs> it's time to set sails and pray for wind. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for, Lord, the, uh, just the opportunity that is before us. Help us to keep these things before us. And Lord, to be diligent, to go forward into all those things that you have for us as individuals, as a fellowship. And praying, Lord, that we might be pleasing to you and that we might be good stewards of all that you have blessed us with as a church and as individuals, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.